Welcome to Strip Coverlet, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I'm Adrian Ford, and we are here for the fourth in a four-part series as we tackle Ghosts by Henrik Ibsen. This being the conclusion of the journey through Ghosts by Henrik Ibsen, this will be the review, part four of four. We will have three good things, three bad things, quotes, uh, discussion based on the text, and then we will finish up with a rating and recommendation based on the play itself. So starting... Three good things. Number one, tension. This play sets up tension immediately. Uh, right from that first act, right from that first scene, we have Regina with her father, Ingstrand. And even there, the very second line of dialogue is Regina delivering a line beneath her, or below her breath, uh, which is sets up a type of tension between her and the other character, who we then learn is her father. Um, and there is much to be found out from there. There is further, um, there are dynamics between every character herein. Between Mrs. Alving and um, her son because of the secrets of his father and her husband, between her and, um, wh why am I blanking here, Regina, because Regina is not her daughter, but sort of like a stepdaughter, um, between Regina and Ingstrand, because Ingstrand is not her uh, Regina's father, uh, between uh, Mr. Manders and everyone, essentially, because they're all lowly sinners. So there is immediately... Um, tension between all of the characters, but there's also tension between the acts. Each one of these acts stops, uh, one to two stops with secrets between characters that are needing to be revealed. Two between three stops with an orphanage burning down. So there is tension on all levels uh, in dialogue between characters and between scenes here. Um, number two on good things, this touches on a lot of subjects in just 60 pages of a play. Uh, you've got family, you've got religion, you've got art, you've got legacy, you've got duty. All of these things um, are things that have been touched on in both of the Henrik Ibsen plays that we have read to this point, uh, Peer Gint as well as A Doll's House, uh, but they're also on display here in masterful fashion in just 60 pages, and we'll get into those a little bit in the discussion of this text. But finally, the third good thing about this text, this text ends with failure. It ends with failure and disappointment for basically all parties involved. And that is something that is maybe not inherently good, but it is definitely something that is difficult to talk yourself into as a writer. Uh, and that tragedy happens for all of these characters, and it happens in a way that is conclusive. Not one that leaves us hanging and wondering um, so much about characters, but we know the direction in which they almost must be traveling to move forward with their lives after this. Which, is, even that is difficult to pull off as well. Moving on, three bad things. Uh, number one, and this is not a this is not a criticism for me, but I can very much understand how someone would read this and be bored out of their mind. There's not a whole lot of movement, there's not a whole lot of action, and there's not a whole lot to laugh at. The only thing we really have is stuff at which we are forced to wince. So there's not a whole lot of range. There's a whole lot of topics covered, not a whole lot of range. Uh, basically just disappointment and guilt. Number two, I think that the questions which aren't answered here, every, every text is gonna leave questions unanswered. A lot of times those are not answered so that the reader must draw their own conclusions. Sometimes they're not answered because they are just not crucial to the story. And I think that the two glaring questions with which we are left at the end of this text 
might have been left out because they are not necessarily um, important to the interpretation of this text. But I think that if those two glaring questions had been answered, this text could have been a whole lot better. That being, how is it that Mr. Alving died? And how is it that Joanna died? Joanna being Regina's mother. Um, and the third bad thing about this is sort of a nitpicky something I want for me. I wanted to see more Engstrand. I wanted to understand Engstrand a little bit more. He's a character here that is the most seemingly stand-up guy that we've got, despite the fact that he is the character that almost everyone in the story kind of hates. Mrs. Alving does not want to send her daughter, or her servant, and not, and not her daughter, uh, Regina, back to live with her old man because she doesn't like him. She thinks he's a bad influence. Regina wants nothing to do with him because he's a bad influence. Manders, one of the very first things out of his mouth when he shows up on the scene is, hey, your old man's a bad guy. He needs some guidance. Uh, we don't really see inter any interaction between Oswald and, and uh, Ingstrand. But even, even the absent character Joanna doesn't really like him, though she went and married him and allowed him to father her child. No one likes the guy, but he seems to be the most stand-up individual here. So I'm wondering if no one likes him just because no one likes him, which is possible. It, everyone knows that guy that, you know, he's, Scott's a great guy. I just can't stand the son of a bitch. Is that the case? Or is he, does no one like him, and is he wayward because he's a weasel? And he, he spent, like, all of the seeds that he's planted here in this play are that he's just the stand-up guy. He wants to set up this sailor's home, not for himself, but for, he knows how wayward a man can be, how wayward a man can get. He um, fathers Regina because she was the daughter of the woman that he figured he loved before he really even knew her, and it was the right thing to do. Not only that, she came with some money, and he didn't want a penny of it. So, I want, I want the wayward play of Engstrand. I want a little bit more of that, and we didn't get any of it. Moving on to quotes, uh, some good quotes from the play I Have Three. Not a very quotable piece. Um, I think it's very well written. I think that it's um, very interesting. I think that it is a text which presents a lot of ideas, but it did not distill them in, in many ways, if, if that makes any sense. Uh, it is not quotable in the way that the Russians are often quotable, in that what we're doing is we're setting these ideas against each other and we are using the characters to put forth these little thought nuggets that really crystallize things. There's not a whole lot of those moments. One of them happens on page 19, uh, when Manders asks, when speaking of a wife's uh, duty, he asks, what right have we to happiness? What right do we have to be happy? And I think that's it. A, what right have we to happiness is just a hell of a quote on its own. I mean, that's a tattoo somewhere. Um, I don't know where you'd put it, uh, but it's definitely an interesting tattoo. But when you think about it, what right do we have to happiness? It sort of reminds me, oh no, I'm losing it. There's a quote, uh, I can't think of who it's from, but you should be ashamed to die until you have added something to the human experience. Until you have contributed to society in some way, you should be ashamed to check out. It reminds me a lot of that quote because what it's doing is it is setting up that life is about responsibility, life is about duty, and there is no time or place to dally until at least you've contributed. What right have we to happiness? It, which is not to say we, we are not supposed to be happy. 
It's just stating basically that happiness is a luxury, not a right. It is not something that you were born and you get to have. It's something that you must earn, which I think is interesting to play with, at least. At least that is interesting to play with um, some night when you can't sleep and you're trying to figure out God, right? Another good quote uh, comes to us from Engstrand on page 35. Yes, I do make bold to say that I brought up the child and made my poor Joanna a, hap a loving and careful husband, as the Bible says we ought. But it never occurred to me, to your reverence, to go to your reverence and claim credit for it, or to boast about it, because I had done one good deed in this world. No, when Jacob Engstrand does a thing like that, he holds his tongue about it. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen often. I know that only too well. And, when I, and whenever I do come to see your reverence, I see him to have anything but trouble <clears throat> and wickedness to talk about. Because, as I said just now, and I say it again, conscience can be very hard on us sometimes. Uh, this is perhaps a long-winded way to say what right have we to happiness. Uh, this is Engstrand laying out his case and giving us the fact that maybe, just maybe, the reason everyone hates Engstrand is that Engstrand's only willing to come forth with the most honest version of himself. Maybe that's it. Engstrand doesn't care to make a social construct. So whenever it is that he comes to Mr. Manders, he's not coming to brag. He's coming because he needs the word of the man of God. So I think that that is an interesting quote as well. Further and finally on page 54, we get this from Regina, which is very much the same theme. Uh, no, indeed, a poor girl must make some use of her youth. Otherwise, she may easily find herself out in the cold before she knows where she is. And I have got the joy of life in me too, Mrs. Alving. I think that all of these quotes really sort of drive home that first quote, what right have we to happiness? Uh, happiness may be getting a bit of a bad name in that way because mightn't it be fulfilling duty which makes us happy? But it is saying that happiness for happiness sake might not even be worth having. So thematically, what is going on here in this story? The first thing that one has to sit down and really contemplate when you're talking about a play where everyone present is under some misunderstanding or misapprehension about family. Um, and I think you've got, to, you've got to talk about fathers a little bit. Um, Mr. Alving is an absent father. He's dead, yes, but he is absent on top of that, in that just because he's dead, he could have left some type of legacy that was worth teaching his son. He could have left some type of legacy, and it's rough, it's hard, because the entire play is really sort of from Mrs. Alving's point of view. We get a little bit from a talk between her and Manders about her husband's legacy, but in fewer words perhaps than that. And apparently, the guy did something in his life. He was a captain. He left a great deal of money. He left what seems to be a very large house. But his legacy that we see is told only through the fact that, through the stories of his dalliances, the fact that he had extramarital affairs, the fact that he had premarital affairs, that he was a fallen man. 
That seems to be the only thing that we get about his legacy. Which is strange for a guy who's referred to as captain. Mightn't someone need to do something rather important in their life to be a captain? Mightn't someone need to do something rather worthwhile in their life to have accumulated this type of wealth? Uh, perhaps it was inherited. Perhaps the station in society and therefore most of the title uh, was more or less inherited. We don't even have that much information. Mrs. Alving has excluded everything about her husband from the reader. And everything happens, um, everything happens in that house and in two rooms in that house. One, I believe, is the living room and the other is the dining room. The dining room in which, um, Mr. Alving had, in which Mr. Alving had cheated on his wife. So we've got that image of the father. We have Ingstrand as well, who is not a biological father, but who, again, we have a very, of whom we have, again, a very limited scope. He is someone about whom details are provided, but only from people who seem to have some slant against him. Again, everything that we are provided about Ingstrand does not only make him a pretty good fella, makes him the best guy in the whole damn play. Makes him the most stand-up character in this entire play. No one likes him either. Mr. Alving's getting a rough time here. Ingstrand's getting a, a rough time here. And the third father we have, and perhaps I am out of sorts with my church terminology, but we also have Manders. Is Manders not a father? A father in the church? If that is so, he is just as absent as Mr. Alving in that he is completely out of touch with all of these characters. But he's also less of a stand-up guy than Ingstrand. So, in his most holy of roles as father in the church, he's probably the worst father present, or accounted for, or mentioned in the entire text, which is interesting. Uh, and then on top of that, you have God the Father. God the Father as well seems to be absent. The one thing that God could look out for in this text and be good to people who have some goodness coming for them is the orphanage. Which was, by the way, namely in a name set up for people without fathers. You go to the orphanage when you don't have parents. So in all these ways, we have the idea of the construct of father being torn down. But it's not just fathers. It's mothers as well. Perhaps the idea is parentage as a whole. Joanna, the, the mother, Regina's mother, which is given to us only in idea, is completely absent from the text and is not even mentioned as a reality in the text until I believe the end part of Act 2. Or maybe it's the beginning of Act 2. Maybe that's when they... Either way. Um, she is A, not present, but B, seems to really not have looked out very well for her daughter while she was around. And we have no idea to what extent she was around. Uh, at least I don't remember it. Perhaps it's in there and I overlooked it. Um, but we don't have any idea of the guidance that she provided. We get that she went to Ingstrand and offered him that purse with which she, was, she had parted ways with the Alvings. 
Um, and it was Engstrand's idea to go ahead and say, no, we're going to use that to raise the kid. Further, Mrs. Alving seems to be a pretty terrible mother. Um, her son has gone wayward. Her, I don't know how to say, it's not her stepdaughter, but we're going to refer to Regina in that way because she has sort of kept her around. She has not looked after that relationship, which could have been extremely incestuous between her son and Regina. She seems to be completely aloof to that. She is tasked with one thing by Oswald at the end. And it would be a very difficult thing for a mother to do. It would be a very rough position for a mother to be in. But when that opportunity comes forward and it necessitates the hand, kind of necessitates the hand. Um, especially, I believe this is syphilis uh, with which Oswald is charged at the end. Um, that, holy shit. If you've never uh, looked at the effects of syphilis run rampant, syphilis in a society that did not have an answer for syphilis, awful, just awful. Uh, called softening of the brain, drove you crazy, you were in constant pain, uh, it ate away at the soft tissues. Um, just would have been miserable. And you would have been basically trapped inside your own body. I, I can't imagine the pain. I, just look into it if you've never heard the effects of syphilis. But if that is indeed what it was that Oswald had... You've got to pull that trigger as a mother. You've got to do it. Uh, but she's paralyzed at the end there. Um, the next thing I'd like to say about this text uh, is not so much... Okay, so we'll go to another theme. Uh, the theme of religion. The most befuddled person in this play is the man of God, is Mr. Manders. And we get this time and again through the eyes of... Ibsen, the faults and failings of religion have popped up in all three of the plays that we have read thus far. And notably here, through the wisdom of Mr. Manders saying, we will not ensure the orphanage if it is the will of God, because it would show a mistrust of the will of God. And then it's Mr. Manders himself that accidentally burns the place down. So that is... When that is the only presentation of religion in your play, it's a commentary on religion. Um, just as a sort of a, a note on the play itself, Mrs. Alving is the least compelling character in this in this text. She's the most boring and the least willing to act. Engstrand is the most interesting, the most forthright, and the most action-packed. Um, so it would have been... It would have been interesting... It would be interesting to see this play from Engstrand's point of view. I think that there is definitely there's at least an essay in there to be written. This play from Engstrand's point of view. What is going on through Engstrand's eyes here? The one thing that we have which is really damning on his character is sort of the fact that he does... He seems to love Regina. He seems to really care for Regina. He seems to want the best for Regina moving forward. We don't really get any dialogue about him missing his wife. And I don't know if the dynamic was ever presented between them, but we never get really any hint that he is unwilling to lose Regina. So at the end of this play, when Regina does not go back to him, 
when Regina in fact catches up with him and Manders and is choosing Manders over him. I wonder what that play would be. Uh, but finally, rating and recommendation. I would give this play 82 Burning Orphanages out of 100. I think that there's a lot going on here. There's a lot to talk about. There's a lot to think about. There's a lot presented. But there's not a whole lot going on. And the most, the biggest thing that happens in the text, the orphanage burning down, is predictable since the time the orphanage, the idea of the orphanage is presented. When Mander says, no, we don't have to insure it. You know it's going to burn down. You know something bad is happening. When Ingstrand is noted as being careless with matches, you know it's going to burn down. The only wool that's pulled over our eyes is we presume it's going to be Ingstrand that burns it down. And maybe he did, but we've no reason to mistrust him. Uh, I want to know if he is an untrustworthy character as opposed to probably just sort of a prick. Uh, but recommendation, based on the text, if you like this, I think that you would like As I Lay Dying by William Faulkner. The dynamics between characters, the dynamics due to family, the attitudes towards religion and God's will are very all very comparable, including questions of paternity and questions about the all the all father as it were so i think that if this if um ghosts is something that you d even the presence perhaps of ghosts if ghosts is something you liked you would enjoy as i lay dying by william faulkner that is all i have for this review and i hope to see you back next week um, as we start a new journey and a new pr uh, project here on the channel